and now it's 12 o'clock good 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 morning everyone can you hear me yes it is clear yes go ahead good morning everyone it's my great pleasure to introduce dr cecilia c williams from sandia laboratory us for the talk uh, in our international webinar series of international uh, indian veterinary association first of all, uh, all i would like to thank dr cecilia for sparing the valuable time valuable time at this um, busy times of uh, the covid as well as the odd hours in usa dr cecilia williams really indian veterinary associations appreciate your efforts dr cecilia v williams is double master msms and phd is a principal member of technical staff in global chemical and biological security group and sandia national laboratories over a 38 year career in sandia she has worked as a principal investigator on diverse chemical portfolio including defense initiatives environmental restoration technology development strategic petroleum reserve projects scheme bio warfare agents decontamination technology transfer and commercialization algae biofuel research and development the full scale biological threat prioritization for chemical and bio risk management curriculum also and field development currently cecilia leads the groups chemical security initiative in india as well as the bio risk management initiative in india and the philippines and conducts analysis to support the us government chemical biological threat decision making also she has actively participated in many of the groups laboratory chemical risk and bio risk management trainer efforts previously cecilia was a part of sandia team and developed and tested the sandia decontamination form that did contaminate both chemical and biological agent i hope this decontaminate the coronavirus as well she is also certified in hazardous waste management and has worked on a number of technological demonstration aimed at transitioning former eastern bloc technologies to the usa k muni and c williams recently completed a study on proliferation of skills and expertise at chinese bioscience research institution and biotechnology sector created by the flow of people and ideas between india and china cecilia has master of science degree in organic chemistry and indigenous geology from the university of new mexico cecilia earned her phd from texas a and m university researching the interaction of a rotavirus non structural protein entrotoxin with cellular kaolin with these words i would like to add that dr cecilia have done multiple training program in india and we are in the process to set a center in punjab university on the bio safety and bio risk as well as she is focusing now lately on the veterinary education and we are also planning multiple training on that front so now i hand over the trade farm to dr chirantan kaidan uh, president indian veterinary association for the uh, start and inaugural address uh, dr chirantan kaidan sir thank you dr vijay paul a uh, respected honorable dr cecilia we welcome you to this webinar session in india and we are thankful to you for your presence here to give us a very knowledgeable talk today ma'am indian veterinary association is associate of affiliate association of world veterinary association and it is a event of the world veterinary association as well i am very happy to inform you that we have got a very good response and possibly as discussed with you yesterday we will have more of such webinar sessions with you we regret with our fraternity that we had to do it on zoom maybe madam next time we will not be doing zoom because from today tomorrow onwards we are boycotting as association everything associated with china china has done a lot of harm to the not only india but across the borders all over the world and we condemn the activities 
of the Chinese government as such. Today, with your permission, ma'am, I would like to submit that Indian Veterinary Association just to take an opportunity of uh, around five to 10 minutes to be with our fraternity that Veterinary Council of India elections 2020 have been announced and the nomination process is going to begin on 7th. We are thankful to the ministers, officers of the DADF, rather DAHD, Department of Animal Husbandry and Daring Officials. I have lost audio. Cecilia, wait. Okay. I think yeah. some uh, connectivity problem. Yes, yes. We can wait uh, for some time, otherwise we will start with you. Yeah, let's wait, sir. To bring about changes, yeah, yeah. to bring about reformation to the profession. We have formulated a strategy the day we revived Indian Veterinary Association. Rapid, I call, it is our slogan also. Rapid, responsive, attentiveness, aggressiveness for the people, for the demands. So our responsiveness has been the hallmark of the new Indian Veterinary Association. We are intervening for everybody directly on request of the state associations, on request of the small groups operating across the country and even individuals. We are affiliate uh, apex body of 30 state associations. And we are proud to claim that the majority base of the country's veterinarians are aligning with the Indian Veterinary Association. Indian Veterinary Association is one chapter across the world, which is catering to all the sections of the veterinarians. Now, as on date today, I am a member of the World Veterinary Association Council meeting dealing with the veterinary education, which Dr. Vijay Paul proudly announced that MAM is also taking keen interest in veterinary education. And we would like to have MAM interacting with us on the WVAC platform also. I would like to share also with everybody that Indian Veterinary Association has ventured into corporate world also, which is the need of the hour today. We have gotten collaboration with the uh, CGS group of uh, hospitals, CGS Hospital Gurgaon, and in Dr. Samar Mandran has joined as uh, he is director there. Uh, he has joined IVA as corporate member and has willingly offered training facilities to around 20 veterinarians each quarter without any training charges except lodging and boarding. And that will be a big boost for the professionals who wish to venture into the specialization in canine practice. Another corporate uh, step taken by IVA has been to collaborate with uh, Confederation of Indian Industry, 
a big association headed by Mr. Vikram Kirloskar, the big magnet of Indian industry. And the last president was Mr. Anand Mahendra from Mahendra Group. We decided that they all their facilities, convention halls, meetings, they will be offered by CII for a nominal membership fee, which will be paid by the Indian Veterinary Association. It is a very prestigious association and our joining hands has made it for us a lot of prestige coming to us. We are sponsors of a virtual conference on dairy and in the, uh, fisheries, which will be taking place on Sebex, uh, Sesco uh, platform on 26th, where we will have participants as Arun Shir uh, Tarun Shiridharji, ex-secretary, present member, Central Administrative Tribunal, a very prestigious appointment, and we always look upon him as our mentor icon. Then we have Mr. Rajiv Ranjan, the present Secretary Fisheries, who it's, uh, himself embodies the things as a very active bureaucrat, and he has taken uh, many schemes in fishery ahead. The chief guest of the show that day is uh, Mr. Jayaprakash Dalal, Honorable Minister and Agriculture, Animal Husbandry, Panchayati Raj, State of Haryana, one of the most pro progressive states, and he's one man who has not let down the farmers of the state, even in this COVID. Honorable Dr. Uh, Praveen Malekji, Animal Husbandry Commissioner will be the moderator of the day. And I'm proud to say that Indian Veterinary Association and State Association of Haryana, Pashu Chikitsak Parishad, they are supporter organizations of the same. And our people, they will be joining that virtual conference. So not to take more time, I request Honorable Ma'am, to please start with her presentation and enlighten us, the veterinarians of India, and if abroad somebody has joined. Ma'am, please. Certainly, thank you very much, Vijay and Dr. Kadian, for the nice introduction. I'm going to mute, I'm gonna stop my video because I don't like watching myself talk. Uh, but uh, I want to welcome everybody to this Indian uh, Veterinary Association sponsored webinar on SARS-CoV-2, the virus that has caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there will be two presentations in this webinar. The first is hazard characterization, and the second is good laboratory work practices. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that it is very important uh, during your working in your laboratories or, or with uh, your animals to do a continuous risk assessment, especially if you are working with samples that have possibly have SAR, uh, SARS-CoV-2. My group that I work with at Sandia have produced 10 uh, presentations on different subjects. And we have attempted to provide the most up-to-date information that we have on current knowledge of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. However, there are some things that we know and there are some things that we don't know because things are rapidly changing. So it is important for individuals and organizations to be willing to challenge and change procedures based upon new information coming out. 
However, we caution you that you have to evaluate carefully the quality of information that you are receiving for your risk assessment because there is a lot of misinformation circulating. I want to emphasize that biosafety is of paramount importance. However, please do not forget that biosecurity is also important and should not be overlooked. This next slide that I'm showing you are the objectives of this particular module. What we would like you to know by the end of this module is we would like you to be able to enumerate the known and anticipated characteristics of the SARS-CoV-2 that will influence risks in your laboratory, laboratory acquired infections, or possible release of the agent from the laboratory. We want you to feel confident that the information you are receiving is current and relevant and has been reviewed by trusted subject matter experts. experts. We would like you to be able to use this information to inform your particular decisions on bio-risk management when working with or encountering SARS-CoV-2. So I'd like to first start with a couple of definitions because there is some confusion among uh, some people and often in the media. SARS-CoV-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus 2, is the name of the virus that is causing the coronavirus disease and the current pandemic. COVID-19, or Coronavirus Disease 2019, is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. You will often see these used interchangeably. Technically, that is incorrect. One is the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and the other is the disease. So, one of the very first steps that you need to do in your risk assessment is your hazard characterization. So we need to ask the question, what is the potential risks posed by SARS-CoV-2? Well, there's exposure or infection to your laboratory workers. There's accidental release from your laboratory resulting in exposure to your community. That's humans and potentially animals. And also there's a possibility of threat or deliberate release or misuse by uh, an actor who has malicious intent. So in conducting your risk assessment, you need to take a look at the likelihood and consequences associated with the risk and look at the following characteristics of the hazards. You need to look at the route of infection, infectious dose, ease of causing transmissible infection, ease of transmission be between individuals is a highly contagious. You need to look at the time period during which infectious particles are shed from the host. Uh, look at its stability in the environment, its susceptibility to disinfectants, and what are the treatment options available? And a critical question is, what is the host range? So these all must be considered when you are looking at your risk assessment. Well, let's take a look at SARS-CoV-2 itself. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the coronavirus viridae family and it's a beta coronavirus. C corona is Latin for the word crown and it, this virus received its name because of its spike-like projections. Coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a spherical envelope virus encapsulating a positive stranded RNA uh, encoding 30, a 30 kilobase genome. It enters the cell via the ACE2 receptor uh, and it is the causative agent. It has been identified as the causative agent in the outbreak from Wuhan 
in uh, January 2020. It's closely related to SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, as well as MERS, Middle East Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Both of these also were believed to have originally uh, been restricted to the animal kingdom, but have acquired the possibility of infected humans. So, what are some of the uh, what are some of the pathogenesis and clinical features of SARS? Again, I uh, mentioned that SARS binds to the ACE2 protein uh, to gain entry into the cell. The ACE2 is expressed in the cells of lungs, vasculature, small intestines, kidney, and brains. Actually, the, sp the spike protein binds to the ACE2 like a key going into a lock and it allows the virus membrane to fuse with the plasma membrane, allowing it to gain entry, where its RNA is transcribed, leading to viral replication and translation of viral structural proteins for packaging the viral particles and release from the cell. So that's some of the pathogenesis. What are the clinical features that we see? We see dry cough, shortness of breath, muscle aches and weaknesses, fatigue, fever, pneumonia, cardiovascular failure, diarrhea, loss of sense of smell, nausea, vomiting, headache, confusion, inability to stay awake, and some partial or complete paralysis. Not everybody gets all of these symptoms, but these are symptoms that have been seen. So what is the route of infection or transmission. So infection is via the respiratory tract and it's from person to person through direct mucous membrane contact, that's your eyes, your nose, your mouth, with infectious respiratory droplets or infective fluids and fluids. Physical distancing minimizes the effect of the infectious droplets. Uh, transferring from one person to another. There is also can be exposure for contaminated fomites, that is high contact surfaces, such as door handles, uh, counters in laboratory, laboratory workbenches. This particular uh, mode of transmission can be uh, stopped by good hand hygiene and frequent cleaning of surfaces. And so you can mitigate easily this mode of transmission as well as the person to person through mucous membrane contact. There, there is possibility, but not yet confirmed, that you can acquire uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus through inhalation of aerosols. And so because of this, and because it's not yet confirmed, Experts are advising that individuals wear masks in public, particularly where physical distancing cannot be assured. That's like when you are in a crowded market or you're in food shops or a pharmacy. So it has also been verified that there can be uh, pre-symptomatic transmission, and this has con been confirmed by careful case uh, study tracing. There has also been suggestion that viral RNA, viral RNA and radiographic evidence of lung, lung infection has been identified in asymptomatic individuals who do not go on to develop the disease. There is a number of ways that this virus can be transmitted. So some additional hazard characteristics that are still under investigation, the infective dose is unknown. However, since SARS-CoV-2 is similar to SARS-CoV-1 and mers covid uh, it has been shown that their infectious dose is one to 100 uh, viral particles. So there, right now we are speculating that it will be, be similar with SARS-CoV-2. 
Incubation period is on an average four to five days. That's period from infection to symptoms. But it can be as short as one day or as long as 14 days. And it is this uh, length of 14 day incubation that the idea of a 14 day uh, self quarantine has, um, has been suggested. Viral shedding. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 can be shed from pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, and post-symptomatic patients. It is suspected, but not yet verified, that asymptomatic individuals can also shed the virus. So SARS is a novel virus infecting humans, so the population is very susceptible. So there is a vast majority of individuals uh, who do not have immunity. It has been shown that antibodies develop post-infection for most patients. However, it has not been verified whether or not these antibodies protect you from re, um, reinfection. This slide gives some information on stability and viral load. As you can see from this slide, uh, the virus can, as an aerosol, can be sustained for about three hours. That's according to the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, on different surfaces, plastic, somewhere between three to seven days, stainless steel, three to seven days, uh, cardboard, 24 hours, Paper, three hours, wood and cloth, two days, glass, four days. So it can survive various lengths of time depending upon the environmental service. The second slide shows us the, um, oops, excuse me, shows us the how long uh, the virus can survive in human, in uh, laboratory samples. You have feces in urine, one to two days, diarrhea, up to four days. Salt culture, depending on temperature, anywhere from 21 days from minus 80 degrees to room temperature for two days and 70 degrees for um, five minutes. And finally, uh, sorry. Finally, this gives us the viral load on different clinical samples, anywhere from eight times 10 to the four particles up to, uh, uh, that's in throat swabs and in stools, it's a detectable in 53%. Okay, I have to move, some, move this around, oops. Okay, so to summarize, the known characteristics of SARS, this is for your hazard profile, uh, SARS-CoV-2, your hazard profile, is it causes COVID-19 disease. It's an envelope virus, 50 to 200 nanometers in diameter. The primary route of infection is through the mucous membrane exposure to droplets from infected persons or contaminated surfaces. It can be stable up to three days on plastic or stainless steel. It can be effectively inactivated by soap and disinfectants. Since it's an envelope virus, it can be easily inactivated with 70% alcohol because the alcohol essentially desiccates the lipids and uh, solubilizes them. Humans are highly susceptible. Right now, there are the limit treatments uh, have proved, some treatments have proven, in, uh, have proven effective, uh, and there's no uh, particular vaccine. They, there are a couple of treatments. Uh, hydroxychloroquine has shown to be uh, effective in some people, and then uh, remdesivir, which was developed for uh, Ebola seems to show promise. There are a number of groups 
uh, from China to uh, the United States to India and uh, England that are trying to develop viruses. And there's at least five that show promise. The characteristics that we do not, uh, that are still under investigation are asymptomatic transmission. We're not sure if that happens. We don't know what the role of aerosols or small droplets are. We don't know the infective dose. We don't know the length of viral shedding. And we don't have any information uh, whether immunity is acquired after infection. So here, the next uh, three slides are a list of references. And we encourage you, if you're working with the SARS, CoV-2, or COVID uh, clinical samples, to frequently consult many of these resources as there are nearly daily updates on what is known and what is, uh, what is becoming known. And you, you want to frequently look at these so you can update your uh, risk assessment and your hazard characterization. Uh, okay. Uh, that's all I have on the hazard characterization. So I'm going to close this PowerPoint and, and show. And I'm going to open the next PowerPoint, which is on Lab good laboratory work practices. Uh, this particular PowerPoint is focusing on SARS-CoV-2, but let me emphasize good laboratory work practices are, should be always used in your laboratory or facilities when working with any type of pathogen under any circumstance. So these good laboratory work practices are good no matter what the agent you happen to be using. Again, this first slide is on continuous risk assessment. I'm not going to re repeat this. We've already talked about this. But let me caution you to continually assess your risk and to continually evaluate the quality of the information that you're receiving because a lot of misinformation has been circulating. From this particular presentation, we want you to, to take some current guidance for laboratory work with samples or specimens that potentially contain SARS-CoV-2. And again, we want you to feel confident that this information is current and relevant and has been reviewed by trusted subject matter experts. And we want you to be able to use this information to inform your decisions on bio-risk management, especially when you're working with and encountering SARS-CoV-2 in your laboratories. Again, we just reviewed this, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip through this. This is just a repeat of the known characteristics and the characteristics still under investigation. So what we want to emphasize is based upon information for, from the US CDC and WHO, good standard microbiological practices and procedures are sufficient when handling specimens that contain the SARS-CoV-2. So if you're dealing with any type of specimens that are suspected or confirmed COVID-19, if you use standard good microbiological practices and procedures, you should be able to protect yourself and uh, your other laboratory uh, lab mates. So these are biosafety guidelines for procedures. 
As you recall, you do different types of procedures in your diagnostic facilities. And you must perform a risk assessment for every different procedure that you are using when you're trying to diagnose SARS-CoV-2. So the different types of procedures are not, are the first one we're gonna talk about is non-propagative routine diagnostic testing. This is nucleic acid amplification test. This work should be performed in a BSL-2 with standard precautions. When handling the specimens, you should wear a lab coat, gloves, and eye protection. Working with infectious and potentially infectious material and performing procedures that might produce aerosols should be done in a certified class two biosafety cabinet. When you're doing things like centrifuging, be sure to use sealed safety caps and rotors, uh, loaded or unloaded in the certified class two biosafety cabinet or primary containment device. Also, when you're vortexing, adding specimens to lysis buffers, preparing aliquots, diluting specimens, please use a class two biosafety cabinet. For sealed secondary transport of specimens within a laboratory, make sure you seal everything. Okay, let's see. Again, another type of procedure that you might be doing is called point of care testing. That's called POC or near point of care assays that can be performed. These can be performed on events without employing a biosafety cabinet when your risk assessment dictates uh, that it is okay and you have proper precautions in place. This includes when you're using the gene export or other molecular techniques for testing nasal pharyngeal swab and nasal wipes or, or aspirates. In this case, uh, as in with the other testing, there's risk of spills are present because you're in a higher stress environment and the, the individuals may have lower levels of training. So it's important to be prepared for spills, it's important to do your work on absorbent material. And if, if there is any possibility of aerosol generation or sample manipulation, this should be done, should be minimized and should be taken back to the lab and performed in a biosafety cabinet. Again, and using your PPE, lab coats, gowns, gloves, and eye protection. And again, what you use for your PPE is based upon your risk assessment. And your risk assessment may say, uh, we need to add the added precaution of a surgical mask or a face shield or some other kind of physical barriers. It is important to change your gloves after adding patient specimens to instruments. Also, it is important to decontaminate instruments after each run by using an appropriate disinfectant and following the appropriate recommendations for use in dilution and contact time. So you have to, when you're disinfecting, you have to use the right disinfectant, the appropriate dilution, the appropriate contact time, and of course, safe handling. As I already mentioned, you should perform your work on absorbent material in a well-ventilated, uncluttered, oops, uncluttered area. Proper and validated disposal of infectious waste should be completed for any excess specimens. So uh, another important thing that when you're doing point of care testing is try to avoid 
time-related pressures because time-related pressure can cause human error. The other uh, guidelines that we have are oftentimes wastewater and sewage surveillance testing is performed. That, uh, what that is, is that the, we concentrate possible or potential virus from wastewater on membrane filtration, by, by membrane filtration techniques. You need to assume that this membrane filter is contaminated. And so the work must be performed in a BSL-2, a BSL-2 uh, laboratory with uh, unidirectional flow with BSL-3 precautions, and you should wear respiratory protection. And added, you should do this type of work in a biosafety cabinet. Also, when you're doing this type of work, you should don your PPE in an area away from your workspace, and you should take it off in an area away from your workspace. And again, this should be done at BSL-2 levels with BSL-3 precaution. The last type of work you might do is propagative work, that is vi virus culture and neutralization tests. First of all, it is not recommended that you use violation, uh, iso virus isolation as a diagnostic test. This should only be used for research purposes. Again, when you're doing propagative work with SARS-CoV-2, it should be performed in a BSL-3 laboratory. So WHO is coming out with a new laboratory biosafety manual, uh, version four. Uh, the new manual outlines um, requirements for SARS-CoV-2, and it gives inter interim recommendations. Those relevant to SARS-CoV-2 are core requirements and some heightened control measures. So core requirements are a set of minimum requirements that you should be using to describe a combination of your risk control measures. And they should both be foundational and an integral part of your laboratory biosafety. So there's mineral requirements. There are minimal things that you have to do in conducting your risk assessment and deciding what types of risk mitigation measures you must put in place so that you work safely in your laboratory. These measures reflect international standards and best practices in biosafety. And they are necessary to work safely with biological agents, not just SARS-CoV-2. And they are even necessary when the risk may be considered minimal. Here we have a list of the WHO Good Microbiological Practices and Procedures Core Requirements. First one is thoroughly wash your hands, preferably with warm running water and soap after handling any biological material, including animal material, before you're leaving your lab, anytime contamination is known or suspected uh, on your hands. And another one is properly label all biological and chemical and radiological materials in your laboratory. This next one is a very important one. Keep mobile devices away from your work areas because they can easily be contaminated and act as a fomite for infection. I know we're all tied to our mobile phones and we take them with us everywhere, but remember when you're working in your laboratory, 
you should leave your mobile device on your desk or, or away from your workbench. The other, uh, another one is to avoid inhalation of biological agents. So good techniques can minimize the formation of aerosols and droplets, uh, good handling techniques, good uh, respiratory protection. Uh, the next one is wear disposable gloves at all time when handling specimens. And above all, avoid contact of gloved hands with your face. Um, there are other core requirement sections on personal competence training, facility design, specimen receipt and storage, decontamination, waste management, PPE, laboratory equipment, emergency incident, response and occupational hazard. These are all new requirements that are coming out. In the new version of the WHO biosafety uh, manual. Now, the other thing I mentioned was heightened control measures. Besides the core requirements, WHO defines heightened control measures. And these are defined as a set of risk control measures that may be necessary to apply in your facility because the outcome of your risk assessment indicates that the risk is too high to just work with good um, microbiological procedures, practices, and procedures. Um, so based upon the type of work that's being done, these additional measures may be needed. Let's see. Um, the measures that are indicated in the heightened control measures will be based upon your risk assessment and can include, but not necessarily, uh, include the use of a biosafety cabinet, air, directional airflow, or special entry procedures. And again, the laboratory work practices you put in place must be based upon your risk assessment of each and every procedure that you are conducting. I want to talk a little bit about biosafety cabinet set up and use. When setting up your biosafety cabinet, first you, you need to check your filter performance and your certification before use. Your biosafety cabinet should be certified at least once a year. When, you, uh, when you're going to use your biosafety cabinet, turn it on and let it run five minutes prior to use. Disinfect all your work surfaces and wipe off all items that you are going to place in your biosafety cabinet and adjust your sash to your appropriate height. Also, arrange your materials in your biosafety cabinet to segregate clean items from contaminated items. I'll have a slide. The next slide will uh, show you how to set it up. So. When working in your biosafety cabinet, never do any work on the front grill. Always work four inches beyond the grill. If you do work on the front grill or too close to the front grill, you're going to uh, impede the airflow and reduce the efficiency of the biosafety cabinet. When working in the biosafety cabinet, avoid unnecessary movement in the cabinet and around the cabinet. All of these unnecessary movements, again, disrupt the airflow. Always collect your waste and pipettes and cab uh, contaminated materials in your biosafety cabinet. When you've completed your work, wipe down the biosafety cabinet work surfaces. One very important thing that many people misunderstand is the use of the UV light in your biosafety cabinet. 
it has limited effectiveness and does not necessarily get around the little corners and cracks and crevices of your biosafety cabinet. To be effective, your UV light has to be cleaned regularly and the, the bulb should be replaced uh, approximately 90 days after 90 days of use. And you should turn it off when uh, the room is unoccupied after you have uh, allowed for decontamination. This next slide slow shows you how to lay out your biosafety cabinet. This particular biosafety cabinet is set up for someone who's right-handed. Sorry, lefties, uh, I'm right-handed and this is just the way it happened. So I wanna point out several different zones. This first zone here is the no work zone. Uh, this is the first four inches uh, past the grill where you do not do any work and you need, oops, uh, sorry. You need to make sure that any spills or anything that occurs here that you clean up. Then this area in here is your working area. It's directly in front of the worker at least four inches beyond the front of the grill. or the. And this is where you're going to do your manipulation. For right-handed, on the, on the left-hand side of your biosafety cabinet is your clean area. This is where you should place clean equipment, supplies, reagents to be used during your work. On the other side is the dirty area. This is where you place dirty equipment. You should have a place for your pipettes. Uh, you should have a place to collect liquids. You should have a place to collect uh, solid material. And this, so you have a place to discard. Another important area, another important thing to remember when working in a biosafety cabinet, you as the worker can disrupt the airflow. And so you can make it uh, ineffective. So one thing that is advised is don't cross your arms uh, when working in the biosafety cabinet. Do not take your right hand, which is on the dirty side, and reach over for something on the clean side. Use your left hand to do that. That way you ensure that you keep the clean side clean and you're not contaminating it uh, from the dirty side. Now the other thing, that I want to, let me go back one. Let me emphasize, the biosafety cabinet is there to protect you and to protect your work. If you do not use it properly, it will not perform as designed. You must make sure that you don't disrupt the airflow and that people around you don't come and walk and rush by and you must make sure of the placement of your biosafety cabinet. You don't want it placed by a door. You don't want it placed by an air vent because anything that can disrupt your airflow will degrade the efficiency of your biosafety cabinet. Now finally, there are some other key work practices that of which you should be aware. There's decontamination. You need to decontaminate your work surfaces and equipment with the appropriate disinfectant. In the case for SARS-CoV-2, which is an envelope virus, 70% alcohol is sufficient. But any EPA-registered hospital disinfectant that has a label that says it's effective against SARS-CoV-2, you can use. But you must follow the manufacturer's recommendations for use, such as the appropriate dilution, appropriate contact time, and appropriate handling. Also, you can go to the, re the reference of the WH core requirements to identify any additional decontamination procedures that you might need. Additionally, 
uh, my group has also prepared a training module like you're seeing today on SARS-CoV-2 decontamination. The other thing you need to understand about is waste management. Whenever you're uh, working with uh, clinical samples, uh, doing any kind of decontamination, you produce waste. Handling laboratory waste from tested or suspected confirmed SARS-CoV-2 patients should be treated as biohazard waste in your laboratory. There's no current evidence to suggest that this waste needs any other additional packaging uh, or treatment. Uh, this waste, uh, you, can, uh, you can manage this waste the way you do uh, your other waste within your laboratory. In our laboratory, we autoclave the waste. Another area that you should uh, be acquainted with is personal protective equipment. And again, you can refer to the new core requirements for additional information on the type of personal protective equipment you should use based upon your particular risk assessment. If your risk assessment says standard uh, good laboratory work practices are not sufficient, then you go to the WHO core requirements and determine what is needed. And again, my group has prepared two modules on PPE for SARS-CoV-2. One module specific for face masks and respirators, and the other module for other types of PPE, gowns and gloves, etc. And again, we have given you a whole list of references that you should check periodically uh, on if there's any updates or changes. I look every day on, uh, online to see what's um, new and updated. And one thing I found today that I particularly wanted to mention to this group is that uh, Lancet and Microbe just published a page and a half uh, note on SARS-CoV-2 transmission to animals, specifically on host range. Uh, the initial thing they found is that mink farms in Europe, uh, that the minks were getting SARS-CoV-2. And so they started looking at other animals and they are not, there's now concerns about cats and dogs, particularly pets, and there's concerns about livestock. And so the, uh, they are warning that you should watch rabbits, sheep, goats, cattle, and horses uh, as possible uh, uh, hosts for SARS-CoV-2. And what we don't know is if an animal gets it, now can that animal uh, transmit back to humans? And so there is a lot that we don't know about SARS-CoV-2 and uh, about the treatment and vaccine production for COVID-19. So that ends my presentation. I will open up my video. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> Dr. Cecilia, thank you very much. And uh, I, really, I really get so excited to see that throughout there were more than 150 participants actively uh, listening and we see number of the questions which are coming as well as congratulating messages on the this side and uh, the people here are nearly from all over India all the veterinarians are listening to this so first question is from Dr. Soman Ganguly he says the WHO says, Dr. Cecilia, that there is no problem with uh, this asymptomatic people. But you said asymptomatic people have some issue. Can you a little bit clarify? What I can clarify is there is no definitive proof that there is no problem with asymptomatic people or 
uh, there's no proof that they do shed the virus or they can, or they don't shed the virus. It's still under study. And so uh, what's difficult is how do you know if somebody's asymptomatic? And so that's why uh, WHO and CDC are encouraging us to still practice physical distancing as well as wearing masks when we are in uh, larger groups. Okay. Uh, the second question, Cecilia, is uh, what could be the consequence if some have a breast cancer, a lady have a breast cancer and they get corona? Now, I have not seen any data on cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer as an underlying condition. There is quite a bit of data from the United States that people with underlying conditions, like someone who has uh, COPD, someone who has uh, high blood pressure, people who are overweight, uh, people who um, are immune compromised, all those people, yes, have, are, have heightened a susceptibility. And when we take a look at the deaths in the United States, a majority of the deaths in the United States have resulted in people who have an underlying condition, but I have seen no data for breast cancer. Uh, the next question is, Cecilia, and this is very much relevant, can N95 be reused after washing with soap? After wa wash, no, 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 no. Actually, um, I have a couple of procedures that I will email to you, VJ, on, on methodologies that have been developed to uh, decontaminate your N95. And we, that they've done a lot of work here in the United States because we have a shortage of N95s. And so uh, I will send you, I'm writing myself a note, I will send you the there's two procedures. Uh, one is heat, and I can't remember what the other one is, but no, washing with soap or, uh, uh, will degrade the effectiveness of the material in the N95 re respirator. Okay. That is not advised. Cecilia, the next question is, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Can this, Dave, people are asking, since this is enveloped virus, why, why the high temperature is not effective? Why high temperature cannot kill? I can recall in your slide, you said the 70 degrees centigrade for five minutes. So since it is yes. an enveloped virus, why this heat is not working? Why high temperature cannot kill? Oh, how high temperature? 70 degrees kills. Are you this? Uh, I haven't done the particular study. Uh, I would suspect that uh, what we know is to inactivate or kill the virus, you need 70, five minutes at 70 degrees. Higher temperatures will certainly kill it. Absolutely. Okay. And what kind of HEPA filter are being used in biosafety cabinet? Are they different for coronavirus? No, uh, the HEPA filter does not have to be different. The HEPA filter is designed to... Uh, remove particles uh, higher than uh, 0.3 microns and smaller than. And actually, I uh, let me pull out a document. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, biosafety cabinets, the HEPA filters have a specific design. And so they're nothing special. You do not have to have anything special for coronavirus because uh, as I indicated, let me grab this piece of paper over here. As I indicated, the size of the coronavirus, uh, let me, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. well, here we go. Uh, 
It's a 30 kilobase, uh, 16 non structural proteins. It's, I think, 50 to 200 nanometers in size. And if you take a look at a biosafety cabinet, the HEP filters are designed to um, remove anything bigger than three microns and anything smaller than three microns. And it's because of the way HEPA filters work. HEPA filters do not remove things by a simple method. It, it removes things by straining, by impaction, by interception, diffusion, and electrostatically. So there's no special HEPA filter is needed. Just your standard HEPA filter will do the job. Okay. Okay, the next question is uh, Dr. Cecilia. Can we use the, for the collection of sample from nasopharynx and oropharynx, <coughs> sorry. Can we use the uh, RNA letter <coughs> instead of trisol? Can you use what? RNA letter, RNA letter that we normally use in the lab. I would have to look that up on, uh, on the uh, CDC. Okay. It, that I don't know that for sure. I have not specifically <clears throat> addressed that issue. So if you send me that question by email, I will look it up. And so RNA, what you Let lose? It, uh, yeah. Okay. This is commonly being used in lab for the RNA and all these analysis. Uh -huh. Okay. Next question is uh, Cecilia. Can this virus be uh, transmitted to, to a uh, woman who are pregnant first, or can this virus also go through from the lactating mothers? Can this go to the uh, this uh, milk suckling okay. uh, child? Certainly, a woman who is pregnant can be exposed and can acquire the SARS-CoV-2. So the best advice is stay away from infected people. I have not seen any data showing that a female who is lactating has passed on the virus to her suckling child. So I'll take, I'll see what I can find about that one also. Okay. That's the a very next... interesting question. Yes. Thank you, Cecilia. The questions are coming on. Next question is, can this, uh, if we are working on lab animal, animal facility, if we are working in animal facility, do we need BSL-3 lab or can we still be done on BSL-2? Well, first of all, it has not been confirmed on which, what is the complete host range. And right now they are just suspecting that some animals might be um, susceptible. Now, if you have an animal that you believe has SARS-CoV-2, if I was working on it, I would do it in a, at, at minimal, I would do it in a BSL-2 at BSL-3 practices. I, I would make sure I have appropriate PPE, uh, I would have a respirator. I would have like a papper respirator and that would be minimal. If you suspect that the animal does have SARS-CoV-2. Now, if you're just working on a clinical sample from an animal that's suspected, then you can do it in a BSL-2 with good laboratory practices and procedures as you would uh, with a human uh, sample. Okay, the next question, Cecilia, is how long it take for the SARS COVID person to be uh, to develop antibody? Means how long? Means if you are infected today, how long it will take? Well, you know that's a, a question that's still under investigation. One of the things that we have found here in the United States, both in California and New York, is that the population. Uh, that have actually tested people who have not 
supposedly have not had SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. They just asked people who had been ill in the December, January, February timeframe to come in and get tested. And people, there are more people who have, hand, have antibodies for COVID-2 than uh, the number of tests that we're showing out there. So we're suspecting that COVID-2, uh, or SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus has been in the US population for some time and it wasn't recognized as COVID-19. And so how long does it take to develop antibodies? Probably not any longer than uh, it takes for any other disease to develop antibodies. What we have found out is that the T cells, uh, T cells actually, they really believe that T cells actually have a role in virus control and may have a role in producing immunity, but that's still under investigation. Okay. Where'd you go, VJ? Uh, there you are. Yeah, Cecilia, what? Yeah, yeah. There is one more question. Can you hear me, Cecilia? Yes, I can, VJ. I hear you. Hello? Hello. 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 I uh, think ma'am, my interrupt uh, saying we have Dr. Yashpal Manik, one of the eminent virologists of the Indian Veterinary Research Institute. We call it Makkah of Indian pro veterinary profession. Mm -hmm. I would like Dr. Yashpal Malik to interact with the ma'am. Dr. Malik is yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. Cecilia, this, is, this was a very good uh, informative lecture from you. And uh, we, uh, I'm going through all the chats and getting so many queries about uh, the presentation during presentation that they are having. And the main one being a veterinarian, I think uh, everyone is uh, interested to know that role of animals in spreading this um, SARS-CoV-2. Do you agree that animals are the origin of this uh, COVID-2 and what about swine, chicken and so many other species also, dog, cat, which have been confirmed that they are, the, they are uh, having some infections because of COVID. Uh, your views on this. Cecilia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my views. It is my understanding that SARS-CoV-2 originated in a bat uh, and the particular bat was used, uh, a particular species of bat was used in the laboratory in Wunan province. I do not believe that it was spread at an open market in Wunan because that particular bat that was the initial carrier is not found in that market and it's not found in the region for some 900 kilometers. So there is a scientist who worked in the laboratory who was collecting samples from different bats. I believe they co collected a sample from this bat and they were working with it. I also know that work has been done on the spike protein. And there are articles out that indicate that there, there are sequences within this genome that are not common among naturally occurring. I have not seen the sequences myself. I'm still trying to get a copy of the paper. But so there are a lot of questions. Number one, did it originally originate in a bat in a laboratory and somebody carried it out accidentally? 
Number two, uh, was the spike protein manipulated in some way so that it interacted with the ACE2 so that it was easier to infect people? That's another question. It's, I don't have all the data at my fingertips. I'm still trying to collect some data on some of these other reports. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions. And uh, it's unfortunate that the Chinese did not warn the world well ahead of time uh, about what happened. If you take a look, for example, at Taiwan, and Taiwan uh, apparently had close ties with the Wunan province, and when they started seeing people getting ill, and they... they <laughs> and they learned that it was coming from Wunan, the Taiwanese shut everything down. 20 years ago, they were hit hard with SARS-CoV-1. They put in place a procedure to follow if this ever happened again. And they enacted their procedure and they have like 22 million people. And the last time I looked at the data, they had minimal number of cases of, of SARS, of COVID-19. They didn't even have one person die from it. And so I think the important thing is these viruses, because of their small size, are continually uh, mutating. And because of that, we need to be prepared for something like this to happen again. I recently listened to a, a report by another virologist who is saying that this is just the beginning, that uh, they are suspecting that we'll, we will see another virus emerge that has a death rate as high as the Spanish flu in uh, 1918. So, It, there is a lot, there's a lot that's unknown. And um, as a scientist, I can't give my opinion. I can only give you what I know as facts or what I have read. One more theory is about the environmental contamination through this uh, excretion in the stool samples because it is leading to uh, gastrointestinal infections also. The virus is found in a number of 53% of the stool samples from COVID patients. So it is, yeah. it is passing in the stool and stool goes to many form and contaminating the water also. So what yeah. should be done over that issue? What is your uh, advice on that? Well, of course, I can speak to the... Uh, system in the United States. In the system in the United States, in our disposal water, our water, uh, our dirty water, or our brown water, or black water, goes to a sewage treatment plant. And the sewage treatment plant goes through a number of different processes, and it is treated to um, essentially kill or remove of viruses and bacteria because a lot of our water goes back into our river systems. And in order for it to go back into our river systems, it has to be clean and decontaminated to a specified level. And so uh, in India, uh, I don't know what your system is. I don't know. Uh, I haven't had a, an occasion to look at the sewage system and how your sewage system treats uh, your, 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 your dark water. And so you could tell me, uh, what do you do? Hello? Yes, yes, Cecilia. So. Not exactly, yes. not exactly what uh, you told that you are following in US. We are doing same thing. 
but definitely at some of the places the water treatment is done before it goes for uh, reuse or some place so it is being done but still there are chances that uh, water contamination is going on with the covid so remember uh, on the uh, uh, when i was talking about the different types of manipulation that you do where you do non propagative and you do propagative remember i mentioned wastewater sampling that may be something that they can do initially if they are unsure of their treatment is they could actually uh, collect samples of your wastewater and do a collection on a, a filter and treat that as contaminated and then take it back to the, your laboratory or take samples to the laboratory and then test it to test whether or not there is in fact uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in your uh, sewage water. Cecilia, there is one uh, theory about uh, BCG vaccination and how much uh, this could lead to low morbidity or mortality. Any, any advice from you, any remarks on that? BCG what? vaccination. BCG, B that is used for uh, yeah, TB, TB vaccine. Well, That's you know, there are a lot of things coming now. And I hadn't seen that one before. I have, haven't heard that one before. Uh, but I knew, I do know about uh, hydroquinone and remdesivir. Um, people are trying everything to see what works. And um, I applaud them for trying to find a vaccine or trying to find some way to protect um, the populist, and I, I haven't seen the data. Have you seen the data? Does it work? I mean, does it protect people from infection? I don't know because I have not. I had not heard that one. No. Yeah, yes. Exactly. No confirmatory reports are there. Just yeah. people are uh, speculating that it could lead to some reduction. So not exactly. We can conclude that it will work, but so, still, uh, some some reports are there. So it's like I said earlier, both uh, on both presentations, you need to do a continuous risk assessment and you need to take a look at the information that's being put out because there's a lot of information that's being thrown out, not just in the scientific literature, but on all the popular uh, internet sites, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, all on uh, YouTube, all kinds of stuff is being put out. And what you have to do is critically look at that information and make a informed, intelligent decision of whether or not this information is good or not. And typically, if information is good, but it's backed by some type of scientific research and references. If you see something that's just thrown out there and there are no references, no science, then I would question it. Dr. Kadyan? Dr. Kadyan? Yes, sir. I think Hello. the questions are so many, but... Uh, uh, should we conclude now? It, it's uh, 11. Oh, sure, sir. Yeah, it's, mid, it's midnight here. It's time for oh, you yes. to go uh, to bed. Uh, we, we, we apologize for that, uh, making you <laughs> presenting during the old hours. And uh, uh -huh. really, we are very thankful to you for giving this opportunity and giving the time and giving a very informative talk. Thank you very much, Cecilia. So now, now uh, I, yeah. If you... If you want copies of the presentation, I can provide those to BJ. Oh, yes. Or, uh, People are requesting. Yeah. And then he can disperse them because these, uh, uh, these presentations are free to anybody who wants them. And it has all the references and everything. Yes, please mail to BJ so that we can share with all. People are requesting this. Your Absolutely. presentation is very informative, so people are asking for this. Share this with Vijay. 
and then I they will uh, send to the uh, our uh, uh, veterinarians. Very so good. Thank and you very much, Cecilia. And now I uh, uh, request Dr. Kadyan to please uh, have his uh, remarks on this webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank it you was a pleasure to be happy with you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am, for all the information and trouble we caused you at such odd hours, 11 o'clock or more time. But seeing your commitment, we are also exhilarated with the developments and we had a very good talk. We had Dr. Uh, uh, YPS Malik, Yashpal Singh Malik. Mm -hmm. He's a principal scientist in IVRI, coordinating all the webinar series. Then we have Dr. Vijay Pal Singh and the youngster. I think you have not seen him. Dr. Sontake Umesh Balaji. He's also PhD in animal nutrition, conducting these webinar series. And probably, madam, we will request you as you told that day that you are having another presentation ready at your convenience. We will be very happy and now you will have a clientele. Yeah. The people now, who have... Let me mention that I have approval to have four more webinars for the Indian Veterinary Association and I have materials already prepared. Sure, ma'am, we would like to have you, but not on the Zoom. I know. The Zoom is related, too closely related to China. Uh, the Zoom is as uh, enemy yes. as Chinese, yeah? as much so, for you and me. Yes. So, can um, you can you use WebEx or? Uh, I will be using WebEx, ma'am. You you can sure, use WebEx. Next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can use next. WebEx. And also, we, are, we have been approved to use Microsoft Teams, which is another uh, good one. Whichever is convenient to you, ma'am, we will be using that. Okay, that's great. And I want to thank everybody who joined. I know there were lots of people who joined. I want to thank everybody. For we, had, we had a lot of people joining who could not connect on joining on Facebook, ma'am, live. Yes, yes. Actually, it was tele telecast live on Facebook also. Oh, wow. As well as on our website. Oh, very so, good. So, uh, like I said, I will send the presentations to VJ and he can share them with whoever wants them. Sure, ma'am, we have got a very good network. And these yes. days, as we are contesting elections, we have got an election website also. Yeah, okay. And I voted for an American, John D. Jong. He was oh, contesting okay. for the president-elect of WVA also, ma'am. Very good. So, thank you, okay. ma'am, again. Thank you so much. I really, I really enjoy working with my Indian colleagues, and I look forward to uh, holding another webinar with you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Good night. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 bye.